Arush began his career in tea in 1985 with Brook Bond India Limited. Shortly after, the Anglo-Dutch major Unilever acquired the storied brand. He worked for 20 years in India, with 10 years at all six of India's tea auction centers, as a taster and tea buyer, and at the company's blending and packing factories as a tea blender. He then relocated to Dubai, where he spent eight years as Lipton's beverage supply chain director, buying, blending, and packing tea markets across its Asia and Africa region. Over the next decade, his work in the UK focused on consumer research, recipe design, building a tea culture, and training a global cadre of up to 80 tea tasters across Lipton's integrated tea business from bush to brand. He has traveled extensively, partnering with producers and sourcing sustainably certified and organic teas from the world's most exclusive network of growers. He holds a degree in economics from Mumbai University and plans to return soon from the UK to his home in India. Bruce, we've known each other for many years, for which I'm most grateful. As listeners are about to discover, you are a masterful teacher, Yet I recall you describing yourself as a student of tea. Even after 40 years, you know, it, it, it's, it's uncanny. But uh, the, the, the truth is that in any subject matter area, the, the more you know, the more you realize how little you know. And, and, and that's, that's something which has stayed with me. So I think I've remained a student of tea, respectful of the traditions, respectful of the craft. But at the same time, I've always kept an eye to the future in terms of, you know, what's new out there, what's evolving out there, what's somebody, you know, trying to craft differently out there. So there's a lovely appreciation of tradition and trend uh, in terms of my approach. I've always stayed uh, hungry to sort of taste more tea. You know, when I'm on my tasting bench, it's, it's, it's what gives me most joy. If I'm surrounded by people whom I can take through a guided tasting and provide some context with which they can better understand the nuances of tea. That, for me, is very, very rewarding. Listeners want advice on tasting tea and learning what makes tea taste good. Will you share your perspective? First things first, I think there is no right or wrong. You know, as they say, beauty lies in the eye of the beholder. So, you know, one person's good tea may not necessarily be another person's good tea. It depends on how your palate has been conditioned, what your memory structures are, what your associations with flavor are. The best way to learn about tea is is to taste it. I mean, that's what we learned on the bench. Uh, And the more you experiment, you know, you're you're bound to find, you know, your sweet spot. You're bound to find your favorite, as I call it. And I think once you find that, you know, there's no turning back. You know, the tea that you were drinking in the past, you know, you will not go back to it once you actually discover the dazzling diversity and the flair that tea has. So whether it's a, you know, black tea, a green tea, a white tea, a yellow tea, a oolong tea, whatever it might be. I would say as, as, a, as a novice, when you're going into the tea industry, be, be prepared to experiment, but then also be prepared to be surprised. You know, go in with an open mind. Don't have any preconceptions. Slurp as many teas as you like. And I'm sure you will find something which uh, is, is particularly sort of drawing you in. You know, there is a tea for every palate, every price point and every 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 person. Uh, and if you haven't discovered it, uh, trust me, it's still out there. Uh, just go on experimenting and you will find it. And once you find it, there's no turning back. What do you tell someone who asks, how did you become a tea taster? I mean, that's obviously not something which uh, you can ever plan for. I think most senior tea tasters around the world have probably got into the profession, you know, accidentally or by chance. They stumbled into the profession as it were. Because it's not something that, you know, you can get a degree for. It's not something that college counselors will ever advertise saying, you know, go into becoming a tea taster. A a tea taster job is is rarely ever advertised. You know, in my case, I stumbled into it 40 years ago back in India. uh, And it was, you know, at that time, I had no idea what I was getting into. It was something which uh, I was told you learn on the job. You know, you grow on the go. Uh, and the more you do, the better you will get. And guess what? You'll be tasting some tea. You'll be traveling around the world. And best of all, you'll get paid for it. So, you know, what's not to love with that kind of a job description? So, you know, you you stumble into it and then you look at your peers, you know, your, your, as a young management trainee in those days with a large company like Brook Bond in India, 
your your job was not to sit on the desk. Your job was, you know, look at those hundreds of teas being lined up all through the day. And whoever senior taster is tasting on whichever bench, join him. Somebody might be tasting, you know, some or Assam Orthodox teas on another bench. There's some Darjeeling teas on another bench. There's some CTC teas. You know, just go there, do there, imbibe, listen, and, and try and develop your art of association because that is what tea tasting is really at the end of the day. That's what we were we were taught, you know, we were taught. And, and, and one of the things which has stayed with me uh, from the very early days is I was always told that tea tasting is a bit like playing golf. So, you know, you're really competing against yourself. And that was something which appealed to me. This was not something where I had to depend on someone else or where someone else could trip me up. You know, this was this was a battle I could win because you're playing against yourself. So the more honest you are with, you know, how you're doing, it's like your golf handicap. You know, you're assessing for yourself, you're immersing yourself. So it's it's a it's a battle you can win. That's something which appealed to me. So, you know, the, the bottom line was practice makes perfect. So perfect your practice. So that was the mantra which I grew up in, which was all about taster tenacity. In those days, it was a big company. So there was always hundreds of cups of tea being uh, slurped every day. Uh, and at times, you know, we would have to taste up to a thousand cups of tea a day. I mean, so we would call it the the five S's of uh, taster tenacity, which was tea, sniff, sip, swirl, and spit. The more you did, the better you got. There really was no rocket science in it. Let's talk specifically about quality. I spent some time in Sri Lanka last year and had lengthy conversations with exporters concerned that the blends that made Sri Lanka famous now contain very little high-quality, high-grown Ceylon or Chinese chemum as ingredients because somebody said, good tea's too expensive, so let's remove it. Consumers won't notice. What's different about tea blends today than 50 or 100 years ago? I think some of the reality is, you know, tea is ubiquitous. You know, it, it's, it's, it's grown in 30, 40 countries around the world, but it's, you know, drunk in 200. Quality is subjective. I don't think good teas have, have ever gone out of fashion. In fact, when I joined the tea trade, you know, 40 years ago, uh, that was the time when tea used to be packed in tea chests. And you won't believe, I mean, in, in those days, one panel of a tea chest always had emblazoned and stenciled on it saying, it pays to buy good tea. Just six words. They were there 50 years ago, 70 years ago always on one panel of a tea chest. And that's not changed. Yes, uh, the speciality tea industry is a little more nuanced in terms of, you know, appreciating things a little more holistically, what I call the sort of seven P's of, of, any, of any tea, which is, you know, the provenance, the plantation that it comes from, the plucking, the processing, the actual product attributes, but then also the people attributes and the planet attributes. So, you know, tea quality does need to be looked at holistically. It's Yes, it is all about the sensorials and the flavor. And again, in terms of the flavor, I think people need to understand what contributes to flavor as we experience it. So flavor is a combination really of, of taste, of texture, and of aroma. So, you know, taste plus texture plus aroma is really what gives you you know, the, the the flavor profile of any tea. Because what you taste on your palate is the five sort of basic tastes, you know, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and more and more increasingly umami. That's just the taste because that's what your receptors on your tongue pick up. But really when you're cupping tea, you know, we slurp it in to allow it to sort of almost get into our, our sort of nasal cavity, which is where a lot of the flavor and the aroma receptors are located. And that's what you know, so you might get a sweet tea on your tongue, but then it'll turn floral or fruity in your in your nose. I think people need to understand very simply that you know taste is uh, people sort of use the word flavor very loosely, but it's really a combination of taste and texture, which is on your tongue, but then also most most importantly, you know your the aroma which is actually in your nose, which is why you know when we tea tasters have a cold and our nose is blocked, you know, we can't taste uh, because 80% of, of taste is actually smell. I don't think good tea has ever gone out of fashion. In fact, if anything, in the last few years, I'm looking at 
more and more brands and establishments putting a lot of effort into the quality of their tea blend recipes, you know, and their ingredients. And as long as that continues to happen, tea will continue to build respect. Consumers seeking premium beverages are looking for something distinctive. The phrase I hear in discussions about fine wine, especially coffee, is it's more than a score. Intrinsic values are hard to quantify. You can't assign a 96 or a 94 because that does a disservice to aspects that are better described than measured. So talk about the importance of distinctiveness in discerning good quality tea. If you travel around the world, you know, you 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 find teas which, um, you know, really sort of have a signature character. They, are, they have a very clear sensorial direction. And as you as you evolve as a tea taster and you open yourself up to, you know, teas from around the world and different sensory profiles, or almost sort of straddling a, a flavor wheel, as it were, you know. So, you know, if you look at tea, for example, there are, you know, broad families of, you know, florals and fruity notes and vegetal notes and aquatic notes and woody notes and spicy notes. So, you know, it, it's the sensory space is very, very rich. The more you can sort of experience these and actually feel, wow, I get this. When 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 somebody, you know, back in the back in the day when I was tasting SM tea, you know, one tea taster would 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 call something, you know, raspberry jam, and another tea taster would call it strawberry jam. But but the essence of that character was that you know it 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 had that fruity uh, uh, note which is what I was keen to pick up, and and that was down to a certain clone in a certain garden. And week after week, you know when that tea was was tasted, it had that distinctive note. So I think over different teas, over different origins, one learns to pick up these distinctive characters. So you know if it's if it's a kiman tea, it's got a sort of a lovely you know, sort of nutty cocoa sort of a character which gives it a distinctiveness if it's an uva tea from the high elevations of sri lanka again it's got this lovely balmy wintergreen character which really spikes out so you know every tea has got you know it's got all the attributes it's got some mouthfeel it's got some texture it's got some flavor but there will be a spiking out note which sort of gives itself its unique identity and as a, as a taster, I love to explore it, whether it's a, you know, whatever the tea around the world. It's this unique identity you're looking for. If, if there, there are some teas which are smoky, but then some amount of smoke is, is actually a little desirable at times. It's only when it goes over the top and it gets, you know, completely burnt that it starts to taste negative. So, you know, you, you really need to sort of understand the calibrated intensity of flavor. So first I would say, Recognize the families around tea, almost like a flavor wheel. A flavor wheel is a is a lovely aid to have. It's like a visual compass, a diagrammatic lexicon of tea's sensory space. Every tea is has has got this signature character, which is what you know when you source tea from around the world, you are looking for that signature character. You know, will this tea drive a certain amount of color in my blend, or will this other tea drive a certain amount of mouthfeel, or will another tea drive up the sort of aftertaste or will another tea, you know, drive up the sort of nose elements to it. So, you know, you're cherry picking elements and you're cherry picking teas from around the world when you construct a recipe, just like a perfume. You know, you'll have some, you know, you'll have some base notes, you'll have the body of the perfume, and then you'll have some distinctive top notes, which give it a signature character. And that's really no different when it comes to tea. Produced by Adavita Studios. Connect your voice to the world.